first off, I just want to thank everyone in this room. Um, you guys might have noticed this was not like a, a widely disseminated public invitation. These are um, people that we, we really value your opinion. Um, and we view you as people who uh, use war games, who use war gaming data, who are historians, who contribute to data, um, and who have used war games in various kind of means of policy making. Um, so we're really, really excited to start this conversation today uh, with two extraordinary palace, my, my keynotes today. And in true Hoover world, um, we're going to take all their honorifics and I'm, they're just going to be today, they're going to be Gary and Mac. Um, the Gary and Mac are joining me today. Um, interestingly enough, I think what we have here, um, for those of you who don't know, um, Gary was in charge of this little thing called the Navy. Um, <laughs> which means that you know, he is the kind of theoretically the final arbiter on what the Navy asks for and buys um, and probably played in quite a few war games uh, in the process. Um, and Mac was kind of sitting on the other side, right, where you're arbitrating the requests from the services um, and having to make really complicated choices about what we fund and don't fund. Um, so I want to start um, a little bit I'm going to start actually with Mac from the congressional side of the House, um, because I think this is something that we're actually hearing a lot about in recent days, is the use of war games within um, congressional planning processes. Um, uh, Congressman Gallagher, for example, has been using games of the U.S. China Commission to try and uh, inform budget choices about that um, competition. So in your experience, what role did war games play in the congressional side of budget defense budget and oversight? Uh, virtually none on, on a systematic basis. Uh, and I do think it's, it's to Gallagher's credit that uh, he took his whole committee to a war game. And, and, I, do, and I think that helps to change the culture that uh, where you need to kind of explore some options before you start recommending specific decisions. Um, I, I will say just briefly, I participate shows how far I go back. Um, right after 9-11, Gingrich and Secretary Rumsfeld decided we needed to have some tabletop war game-ish things for members of Congress. And I participated in one at the National War College, which was a, a, an anthrax in animal sort of bio event. And, and, and so that did not necessarily translate to budget decisions we were making that year. But it influenced me uh, for, for years to come. I made sure, for example, when I was a subcommittee chair, we had a hearing every year on bio threat and, and humans and animal because it has lots of, lots of consequences. And I've even thought about it with COVID because there are insights you gain with that sort of experience when, like you say, you have to make choices that you really don't get, I don't think, any other way. Love brings me to the next question, which I want to ask both of you. And we'll start with you, Mac. Um, these games that you play in, they seem to have a stronger experiential quality than other kind of data acquisition methods. So our director, um, Secretary Rice, talks about games that she played when she was, you know, kind of not Secretary Rice, about um, continuity of command. And that when 9-11 happened, she knew exactly what to do. And how important and how, how much how much more she kind of learned and remembered from games. So I'm interested kind of from your perspective, you know, were there games like the bio game that you played in that influenced later decisions? And then how do you view um, how being a player in a game influences how you view crises or situations in the future? Yeah, I, I, I think there, there are two thoughts. I'd just say parenthetically, we've had some people in, in recent years try to put a provision into law to mandate that the president participate yeah. in, in some of these yeah. things. It might be a good idea. Constitutionally, I thought it had some trouble. So uh, I think there was some strong language that ultimately got put. But, but, but I, I do think, uh, to your point, when you're there having to make choices not just read about, oh, we don't have enough ships or planes or tanks. You're having to make choices and live with the consequences of those choices. Uh, it, it, it 
at least for me, it penetrates deeper than uh, just hearing somebody talk about it at a hearing or, or something like that. So, so I do think that uh, the more that members of Congress can be torn away and forced to focus uh, for a period of time uh, and make those choices, it will help inform, inform their decisions um, and in a way that will last. And, and like with Secretary Rice, the, it may not just be this year, it may last for a, a longer period of time. Now, secondly, I do think it's important if they can go, uh, particularly people in those positions can go through exercises to, to, to go through what would it be if we've got to go to a hidden place and exercise crisis command and control and so forth. So just going through the motions is, is important. I'm not going through the motions. Going through the experience is important for that. But, but, but the war gaming and the choices you make and so forth, it, it has a real value, especially for Congress, I think. You, you played in probably your fair share right. of games. Were there ones that were more influential to you or games that you led or orchestrated yeah. or required yeah. to happen? I, um, I can give you a couple of examples of some that, that left an indelible impression, but I'm going to uh, talk to those who put on war games, whether you're a think tank or the Naval War College, and I see Captain O'Hara here. Um, by the way, the Naval War College is the ultimate institution for anybody that wants to uh, engage in this. Sorry to the other services. Um, but um, one of the things that I would say is we can look at people that are put in the key decision-making roles, whether it's the president, national security advisor, chairman of the Joint Chiefs. But when the games are, are put together, for those who are organizing them, and I'm also looking at you, Jack. It is so important to have, I would say, the, the commanders and lieutenant colonels as part of that. Because I will tell you that when I was the chief of naval operations, I remembered sitting in games as a commander, watching decision makers try to sort through a problem. Um, sometimes I thought that was the most stupid conclusion I've ever heard. Um, but other times I would say, God, that was brilliant. Um, and, and you, you continue to ponder those as you go through your career. So important to focus on key decision makers that are in the arena and in the hot seat at the time, but don't forget the seat corn because it's in those games that you generate the intellectual juices, the curiosity, um, the ability to think, uh, through some of these tough problems. So. You know, as you structure these, uh, please think about the future generation because they, I think, uh, have, a, have the potential to benefit even more as they can continue to work on it. Now, for me, um, one of the, the most uh, significant uh, lessons I learned um, was one that really brought to the fore logistics. Mm. Um, and guess what? We're seeing logistics play out in a pretty significant way in, in, in our, you know, the current war in Europe. Um, never forgot that. Um, it kept coming back to me as I was having to make budgetary choices. And, um, and I won't say that I always defaulted on what I uh, had learned because you have other pressures that come in and, you know, you have to make choices, but it was always front and center. Uh, the other was, um, really being confronted with the human element of, of cyber. And, um, you know, we can talk about all the command and control, but one of the things that really stood out for me was um, when there was mischief being done, how trust confidence uh, broke down within the command structures. And, and as a result of that, um, and fortunately, I was in a position later in life to be able to restructure the Navy uh, with more of a focus on cyber. We created the 10th Fleet. We created the Information Dominance Corps. Um, and all that came from that, you know, if you want to call it an aha moment that really hit me. 
but then it, then what do you do about it? And that's the real question. So I want to get back to something you mentioned just a little bit ago, because um, for those of you in the room who know, I, I, I am an Air Force veteran, so I'm strongly aligned with you know the Air Force core values, but I, I did spend three years at a Navy institution uh, working at the Naval War College. Um, and when you look at the history of war games, it is almost impossible to tell the story of the history of war games in U.S. foreign policy without talking about the Navy. And I think quite often, the, uh, particularly the inner war years get quoted, um, but also the, the, the global games and then more recently the degree games run. Um, but I was interested, do you think that the Navy has a unique perspective on war gaming? I think the Navy has a unique heritage on war gaming. What they do about it is what current leaders have to deal with. But I think it's the, you know, that period of the interwar years um, was absolutely critical. And if you look at that period of time, um, you know, games were pretty much what you did because of the, the resource constraints and things like that. And fortunately, there was the discipline. Um, there was the, the focus on how would, how would we deal with some of these threats that are coming up? And, and I know most here have, have heard the, the quote, um, that was made, um, that there was only one thing that surprised us as we moved across the Pacific. And that was the kamikaze. Everything else had pretty much been thought out, but that, um, uh, the dimension of the kamikaze was just not in the cards. And so, you know, did it all play out just like the game said it would? No. But at least the, the, the plan was there and, and a confidence. And then I go back to this, who the players were. The, 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 the players that were in some of these games were then the ones that marched across the Pacific to victory. And so, um, you know, I think that heritage is something that cannot be lost, and we really need to keep the emphasis on it. May I make a, just to amplify Admiral Roughhead's point, at, at, a, at, at a certain level, obviously, it's military decision-making that you're testing out. But once you get to uh, another level, I think it's really important to have some political people involved. I, I was recently involved in a war game where I have no di I, no doubt that I frustrated the military tremendously. Mm -hmm. And 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 to your point, the captains and the colonels needed to to be frustrated right. a little bit because that's the way it's going to work in in the real world. Mm -hmm. So so having that element uh, with, of a little different way of of thinking of things, you know, worried about constituents or whatever the deal is, it I think it adds a certain realism, at least at a certain level. Yeah, that was something that we actually played with a little bit when I was at the Naval War College. Um, but it's very scary for, especially in military commands, putting a lot of resources and effort into a, a war game to then bring in a, a political uh, player. Uh, I, I think it can be a little bit frightening, but I think and that actually is something that probably a, a civilian game would be able to do much more uh, without as much fear that they were going to unduly influence the, uh, you know, the chair of the armed service committee in the wrong direction. Well, maybe that's why farmers are okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you have no influence. Yeah. Uh -uh. Exactly. Um, so going back to kind of the role of Congress, um, if you go through the NDAA, there are examples of when Congress has required war games to be played. Um, as that are not kind of things that the, the Navy wanted to do or the Air Force wanted to do, but instead are kind of coming from the top down. Do you see a role for forcing games that the services might not otherwise uh, decide to play? Maybe sometimes. Uh, obviously, we're all going to be better off if we can do this jointly uh, with both the, the military and Congress and learn insights jointly. Uh, what you have to be a little careful of is, okay, Congress made us do this, we'll do it, but we're not going to pay attention to the results. Well, that didn't accomplish it. So, so I do think um, it, the more you can do it together, the better. Uh, I also think uh, the way technologies such as AI are advancing, there really are more opportunities to, 
to gain greater insights that will benefit both both branches of, of government. If, um, and, and you also can't forget that there are politics within the services. And, and when, uh, when you look at a game and when you're trying to get to uh, some ideas about how to move forward in the future, um, at, it, it, if you're in charge of the game, it's always wise to be aware of what the agendas are. Um, because if, if you're not mindful of that, the game can reinforce the agenda and not really get to solving a thornier problem. And so, you know, that, that's something that, you, you know, you have to give people the reins. Um, but, it, but uh, you know, as, as the Navy chief or as the fleet commander, I, I, I would always be thinking about, you know, is, is this the way that, you know, is this a legitimate outcome or is it being driven to a particular outcome? And and again, I you know I don't mean to sound conspiratorial or anything like that, but 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 that stuff happens. Um, you know, the submariners will always want the submarines to win, and the aviators will want the the airplanes to win. Um, so I just you know you have to keep that in mind. We we like to say there's an inner game, and that's the game you're playing. But there's an outer game. And that's the political game that's being played when you get that relationship between the sponsor and game design. And fun times, especially for historians that are looking at wargaming data, and sometimes it's actually more interesting looking at the outer game and understanding what that reveals about institutions historically. But now both of you are, are kind of pure civilians now. Um, and we started this conversation talking about war, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about the applications of gaming beyond war. Um, it was very important when we formed this initiative that it was war gaming and crisis simulation. Um, so I'd love to hear whether this really is, should just be about war or if there are kind of extensions that you see that might be helpful in the civilian life. Well, I, I would go back to, to, to my example where you have a biological event you don't know whether that's a, a bad guy doing it, if it's a naturally occurring thing, uh, you know, and all those, a lot of those hearings I talked about, we couldn't get HHS to talk to DOD. So civilian participating uh, in a crisis situation, especially when you've got different government agencies, different committees of Congress, all of that, and, and any way you can force them to think about this problem together is going to be a tremendous, tremendous benefit. And I think the, to me, the biological area is one that's, that still haunts me, but there are probably other crisis areas where you can bring in civilian agencies uh, with, with the relevant folks in Congress and get some real insights. Yeah. Um, I, I think one of the things that has really been brought to the fore uh, in Ukraine is the importance of gaming the economic dimension of warfare, um, and particularly the application of sanctions. And if all of us in this room for a minute don't think that those games aren't being played in Beijing right now, you know, oh, you can buy me a drink after this is over. But so I think we, I think that's an area that is really going that we really need to spend time with and. And that means, in, in my view, opening it up uh, or opening up participation to bankers, to the investment industry, um, because I, my, my sense is that I can go into a, into a war game and talk about, um, you know, the potential um, actions of China. And I can have a conversation that will sound one way. If I sat down with a bunch of investors and bankers and um, industrialists, I want to have a very different conversation. And so um, I think that we really need to, to really take a look at how the economic fabric is going to, to, to be played. Um, the other area that is of particular interest to me as, as we go forward and, and um, that um, I, th I think that there are a couple of predictors about our future that can connect what the military needs to be uh, looking at. And one is demographics. Um, they don't change. 
Uh, you know, what we have today is going to be pretty predictable about 20 years from now. Um, and whether we agree and we can argue the, the merits of it, but the, the, the changes that are occurring on the planet, when you overlay those two together, I think you're going to be able to find where there's going to be stress, uh, friction, and conflict. And so, you know, in my view, that's a, that is something that at least could get people thinking about where the likely um, friction points are going to be 10, 15, 20 years from now, because I think some of those trends are, are, are pretty predictable. You know, we're seeing it in the Horn of Africa, for example, um, and, and in the Pacific Islands. So uh, I think that's an area that would be worthwhile gaming. And the, and the beauty of that is it allows you to bring in uh, friends and partners from other countries because that's kind of a benign thing to do. But you also will glean some terrific insights on how they think about uh, strife, conflict, and, uh, and friction in their part of the world. So that was kind of the, the look at how war games can be used to understand the future. Um, but a lot of what past war games can be used for is to understand um, history and for us to understand why uh, or how we thought about problems. Um, I was wondering, kind of from your perspectives, are there any kind of historical questions or um, historical war games that you think deserve a second look or that deserve a look at by historians and political scientists to better understand? I, I mean, I, I think at our time, um, going back and, and looking at the, the games of the inner warriors in the Pacific, um, you know, the geography out there hasn't changed. The, um, the national, um, animosities and affiliations, they may be masked over a little bit, but they still exist. So I think, I think that is an area that would be worth uh, studying. The other would be to go back to the early days of the Cold War. You know, we look back on how things played out with the Soviet Union, but the early days of the Cold War were you know, we, we didn't have a good lens looking into the future. And I think it would be helpful to go back and, and, and visit, um, visit some of those. I think it would also be very interesting um, to engage, uh, for example, India mm. on, on how they have gamed China. Because that is, um, you know, my, my view is that in Eurasia, the four empires are back at it again. Russia, Turkey, Iran, uh, and China. And so looking at how the Eurasian tensions play, I think would be a very worthwhile exercise. Again, trying to look into the future by looking at the past. Isn't, isn't that an interesting insight to me that perhaps you could uh, more easily get the Indians to participate by, by having a, a war game that was set in the past, oh. but in doing so, you gain insights into the way they look at things. I mean, one of our big challenges, I think, is to, to advance the thinking about war and conflict and how it's, it's changing so, so rapidly. And going through those things, I think, could really help advance our understanding, but also our understanding with uh, partners, allies, partners and allies, and and that would be very incredibly valuable. I would say the, of course, the the other obvious benefit is while you're doing that, uh, potential adversaries can't see what you're doing. Uh, while as if you're out there doing exercises where everybody can see it from space or whatever, then they're keeping a close eye, but to do the war gaming, uh, you know, you can explore options and not necessarily betray your hand. I think what you're both revealing is actually the vital goal that war games can play in diplomacy and how the process of gaming and of bringing allies or even adversaries together in scenarios can actually create trust and reveal things about the relationship that um, sometimes a planned discussion I, I have, I've sat in a few of these track twos with China and it can be hard to get off the, um, 
the, the, the core um, itinerary. So the scenarios can be extremely helpful. Well, I'm about to turn it over for questions. So I want to ask for final parting shot. Um, and so back, my question to you is, is I mean, there, it seems like War Games is having a moment and there's a real push to try and integrate war into legislation and the policy process, the law process coming out the hill. What, what's your personal view? Do you think War Games can and should be used more in that process? Um, or um, really should they kind of left where they are, which is drawing more kind of in the defense planning? No, I, I think there is... Uh, the advances in technology, and especially if you can have databases of war games that you can mine insights from, that gives us a, an ability to make budgetary and other decisions that is we've never had before. And 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 so you know part of the challenge is you got to get enough members of Congress so away from their phones long enough to to really focus on problems, have to make the decisions like we were talking about. Uh, but, such as Admiral Roughhead said, you start looking at some scenarios, you can't help but have certain takeaways about logistics, about how many munitions you have, about things. Like, and it really brings that home, and that will result, I think, in better informed decisions on where money is spent. And, and, and so you, I think you just got to get them there and get them hooked. Uh, and, and, and then it will, it will inevitably grow as they talk about it. Yeah, there's something about like having someone, a group of people do the same thing for two hours. That is extremely, it becomes an extremely bonding and an important. Yeah. Okay, let's go for a whole day. Uh, <laughs> well, we can host it here at Hoover. It's pretty good willing. Okay. Now, I, what I would say is is um, that I think what is desperately needed um, is for, and, I, and I'm going to say for the services, because, you know, even though you play at the joint level, um, it's the services that are going to be spending the money to acquire um, or to train whatever, you know, whatever that expense could be. And I know that this would be a pipe dream on, on the Hill, but if... Uh, you know, it would be good if, if each service could have a pot of money that that could be used to rapidly react to what you see as, as some of, of, of the needs that, that pop up, as opposed to, you know, getting it back into the budget. And, and I go back to my cyber, you know, epiphany that I had. Um, the, um, I had uh, some money that was called the, you know, the CNO's Reserve. Um, I had another name that I won't use because it, you know, uh, made it sound fast and loose. But, um, you know, as a result of some of the things that we did, we realized that a lot of the young officers coming into the Navy today, even though you think that they're very good with computers, the fact of the matter is they're good on keyboards. Um, and, you know, did they really have a good foundation of, of understanding cyber fundamentals? So I reached into my till and we created a core course at the Naval Academy like that. It wasn't cheap. It was in the millions of dollars to, to get everything stood up and running. Uh, but I really do think that you should be able to have a contingency fund that when you come up with things, uh, and it can be in, you know, a pandemic, it can be in anything that if you, it, that you can move quickly, uh, obviously you would have to be accountable to be able to say, you know, I spent this money for this outcome and, and, and it was based on good, thoughtful work and analysis. And so I think that, you know, if, if, if that could happen, I think that would really begin to get some of the, the wheel spinning that might be able to move some of the necessary change faster through a more structured programmatic process. Can I just say, I think budget flexibility is absolutely the key to the future with technology changing and so forth. But the more you could get, say, the leadership of the Navy with uh, some of the key people on the Hill, you're not going to have differences. They will experience the same thing together, and you're more likely to have alignment of the funding priorities, which is what we all need. And, and maybe a little greater tolerance for a pot of money that mm -hmm. can be used 
if you have gone through that together. Right. Mike, it sounds like you have a new uh, new thing to do. Have fun with that one. Well, I want to open up a few minutes for um, any questions or comments uh, from the audience. Ellie, oh, which we're going to bring a microphone to you because we're recording for posterity's sake. Thank you. I was hoping you could both talk a little bit about what we can be doing as members of the gaming community to make oversight of the quality of games easier for senior leaders, making sure that um, there's some ability to differentiate good games from bad games, how to think about contextualizing games within the broader suite of analysis without spending, here is your thousand page long report, sir. Hope you had time to read that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I again, I would... Um like to see it kind of be a self-forming group that comes together to be like a uh, a steering committee or a conscious of, of what's going on because you're all going to have to um deal with justifying your own you know individual sources of funding and what have you but it, but i think it you could come together because it really gets back to what you were just talking about that that there has to be um a sense that hey these war games are are serious they're uh rigorous they're disciplined and and we can take that to the bank and i and i think the best way to do that is is to kind of you know almost like a self-policing effort yeah and and i would say again primarily from a member of congress standpoint make it relevant to what's going on in the world uh, it doesn't have to be the same place. It doesn't have to be exactly the same. But if if you can clearly say, okay, this is like this situation, or this is like a funding decision we're trying to make over there, you make you you connect it, and then I really think that helps get people uh, interested and 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 focused on it. But at, and and then at the same time, don't have a predetermined outcome. If, if things just go bad, they're going to go bad, and you need to learn from that. You know, so, sometimes I've participated in moral tabletops that were a little too structured uh, as far as the outcome, and that causes you to think, okay, was this all a scripted thing to begin with? No. If, if it goes bad, it goes bad. There's definitely a history of that in war games. and um, Nuclear policy, for example, there's always a, a question of whether you let the game go nuclear. Um, and there's a, a history of games in which that's been a rule where they had to restart if it did go nuclear. Which, if I could add, um, another good reason to bring the Indians into a game because of their relationship with Pakistan. And, and, and they, I think, will have views on the use of tactical nuclear weapons that long ago passed from our memory. And so... Um, you know, they're kind of coming back again. And I think it would be good to get their perspectives because their perspective is going to be very different than our perspective. Uh, Justin Peachy, CNA, for those who don't know. Um, I heard a couple themes earlier. One was, uh, Admiral Ruff had mentioned, the aha moment in action in the games. And then I also heard, let's bring the political aspect into the games. How do you walk that fine line and here's what I mean by that. We want people to thinking creatively in our games. We set up our games to do that. It's it's different situation than you may have faced. And they feel bound by today's current political climate or requirements. And so there's this tension between creative approach to the future, bound by what we do now. How should we better walk that? Uh, getting back to what you said just a little bit ago, uh, uh, sir, about tying it to what we're thinking about now. I, I think I'm, I'm part of my, my thought is, okay, you got to hook these people in for half a day or, or a full day. So that's part of it. Part of my thought is at a certain level, the decisions on whether to use force, what sort of force to use, uh, and certainly if, if you involve nuclear weapons, is going to be a political decision. So, so it, it benefits the military as well as uh, people who may be involved on the political side to, to, to try to think through that a little ahead of time. You don't want the you know, first time you go through all of that uh, to be when, when it's really happening. So, so that's part of the reason I say at a certain level, then it's important to have that, that political component. 
that it would probably not be appropriate for all all levels and all the things you want to exercise. But to, to go back to, to the question, when you got a bunch of civilian agencies trying to figure out how to deal with something, well, then you really need it together, uh, need to have that political element involved. I, I would just say that it needs to come from the top. Um, kind of a, you know, a get out of jail free card or whatever. And, and once people realize that, hey, it's okay to um, run counter to the flow, then I think that begins to set the culture. And, and, and easily said, harder to do, but it really needs to, to start from the top and then um, no harm, no foul when, when you come out of the room. But isn't that, uh, it, it strikes me, isn't that a key advantage we've got over some other countries where you really don't say uh, uh, to uh, somebody above you, that's a bad idea. Yeah. Here, where the, when you bring in the bankers, you bring in political people, you can have this fresh exchange of ideas and you can explore them. And that's one of the advantages of our system. And, and that's one of the reasons I think wargaming is so important. It helps us build on one of our advantages versus a command and control sort of society where dissent is not allowed. Um, hi, I'm Madeline Cruden, um, retired federal employee. <laughs> um, having participated in a few of these um, over the years, one of the challenges that I would love to hear your all's insight is, is um, probably two things. One is the importance of whole of government games, but the difficulty of whole of government games largely derived from classification challenges. So how, how would you recommend taking on um, that challenge so that these whole of government games can be truly meaningful? I don't know, but we've got to figure it out. Um, and, and, and the same is true with uh, foreign involvement. Uh, we want to, to do that with our allies and then no foreign gets thrown in and it makes it harder to have a realistic military game. Uh, when you get in, I keep going back to my biological example, um, then uh, you, we can be, be constrained. And, and, and maybe that's the point. Maybe it's to try to get everybody in a room, trying to figure this out, and and, fig and and one of the conclusions is we can't honestly talk to each other about this because of classification, and maybe that's a that's a takeaway that we need to, to learn from. I, you know, Madeline, I, I, I'll confess the whole of government often to me is like nails on a chalkboard. You know, we talk about it all the time, but it's really hard to do. So. Um, I, I think that there are two, two approaches that I would use. One, how do you bring the entities together with an agenda that you can be in the room together on so that you begin to set the relationships and, and, and that's where I think economics, trade, uh, sanction policy could, could be helpful. Um, industrial policy, uh, as well. Um, and, and then for the game designers here, which I think is a challenge for you, when you look at what you're trying to get out of the game, are there ways that you can inject it and stimulate it in such a way that you can stay away from some of the highly classified, but yet get people to react in a way that gets you to, you know, what you're trying to find out. So, it, you know, that's a, not easy, but, but I think that um, we really need to start doing the um, uh, interdepartmental, interagency work. Um, it, it just it won't work otherwise. We've we've become so much more integrated, um, and and I think that we have also, in the past uh, few years, really moved the needle more toward the military side and our overall policy. And we've got to bring it back because we're getting um, uh, kicked in some of the economic trade development areas. And we've, we've got to game that out because that's where we're not where we need to be. And I think that actually is a great uh, lead in for the third panel because Stacey Petty John will be here, who's been running um, some of the unclassified games that CNAS is developing. And I think there's probably a role for think tank and academic institutions to figure out how to run unclassified games that allow you to deal with at least some of the issues of the whole of government. 
um, without having to deal with the classifieds. There's probably a role there as well. Well, I want to thank you both so much for your time today and um, for these insights. Uh, really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.